Please put your hands together and welcome Jacob Samuel! I want to know, just off the top, by round of applause, who here has recently had a breakup? Okay. Well, it's nice to know that the rest of you are doing well. Uh, also, by applause, who here is planning one? Every time, every time I've ever had a breakup, someone has always said to me the cliche where they go, oh, don't worry about being single. There's plenty of fish in the sea. And as a society, we need to stop saying that. Because that is not consistent with how things are going for life in our oceans right now. Right? An environmentalist would say, worry about being single. A lot. Because there are barely any fish left. There is plenty of garbage in the sea. So I hope you like making out with wet plastic. <laughs> and also, the deeper you go into the ocean, the uglier the fish get. <laughs> That's just biology. <laughs> I think about things like this because I'm a big overthinker. I overthink so many things. Are there any other overthinkers here tonight? Okay, it's a pretty good amount. Some of you may need a few more minutes to think it over. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm tired of being criticized for being an overthinker. I'm tired of it. Because being an overthinker, I realized, is better than being an underthinker. And guess what? Those are the only two options. <laughs> Have you ever talked to an underthinker? They say things like, yeah, I could probably fight a bear. <laughs> That's why there's so many overthinkers. We're better at surviving <laughs> things. Think of the things you say to an overthinker versus an underthinker. To an overthinker, you're like, you're too inside your own head. You're overanalyzing this situation. Meanwhile, to an underthinker, why did you think you could jump that? <laughs> Put your pants back on. Why would you talk back to the police? When I am near the police, that's when my overthinking goes into overdrive. Like, my brain will remind me not to do things I would never think of doing. Every time, every time I'm standing near a cop, a voice in my head just goes, don't touch their gun, don't touch their gun, don't touch their gun, don't touch their gun. <laughs> Then you just stare at their gun the whole time. Now I'm like, I am in too deep. Why is my hand here? <laughs> I'm very cautious around the police. I don't understand whenever people will like physically fight with the police. Because I think as a rule, you should never do battle with anything that is mainly known in plural. <laughs> right? The police always have reinforcements. That's why we call them the police and not a police. Whenever someone's like, yeah, I shoved a cop once. Well, what happened next? The police came. Uh, it turns out they have radios. I'm a big overthinker. Sometimes I'll think too much about a particular word. Then that word will start to bother me. Like, I don't like the word efficient anymore. I don't trust efficient. Because why does it need two F's <laughs> to do the work of one F, right? Come on, efficient, be the change. The next time your boss is like, I need you to work more efficiently, you can be like, well, I need you to think about the words that you use and make sure they aren't stupid. Sometimes it goes the other way. Like, my new favorite word is the word horsepower. I love horsepower. Because that's what horses would chant 
if they were racist. <laughs> right? They go to a secret meeting in the field. I'm tired of all these donkeys taking our jobs. Horsepower. <laughs> People use words incorrectly all the time. Like the words broke and poor are two different words, two very different meanings, but people always mix them up. One of my best friends, he keeps on complaining about how poor he is because he bought a condo. <laughs> I'm like, no, you're just broke because you made an investment. And on the other hand, our other friend is a barista and every weekend he'll be like, I can't do anything this weekend, I'm broke. And then I'm like, no. <laughs> You're poor. <laughs> because you have a liberal arts degree, right? Like you're never gonna fit into the economy anywhere, ever. You're not just poor, you're in big trouble. Like serious trouble, for sure. You know how I know that? Because I have a liberal arts degree. Yeah, and it's in economics which is the best degree you can get if you want to really understand why you're unemployed. <laughs> when you graduate with a BA in economics, the world's like, congratulations, you're jobless. And then you're like, yes. I've read articles about this. <laughs> I know what to do in theory. <laughs> if I was running the central bank. That's what happened to me when I graduated. We already talked about underthinkers earlier in the act. Um, when I graduated from my BA, I didn't have a job, so I moved across the country. I moved to here on the West Coast, and this was a city in which I had no friends. And I had to make new friends from scratch, which is a very hard thing to do. And for the first time in my life, I found it much easier to make friends with women than with guys. Because if I met a woman, I could ask her on a date. And then at the end of the date, she'd always be like, listen, Jacob, <laughs> let's just be friends. <laughs> then I go, yes, that was always my plan. <laughs> what are we doing tomorrow? <laughs> People are so active here. Someone suggested to me, they're like, why don't you make friends by joining a running group. Which actually sounds like a great way to meet 30 people I hate already. <laughs> right? I don't trust people who exercise in herds. <laughs> I'm at the age now, like I'm in my 30s, and everyone I know is getting really into endurance sports, things like triathlons, running marathons. Why? <laughs> Why do you need to run a marathon? Is the pain of existence not enough for you? <laughs> oh yeah, I gotta add on to this. Like other people seem to be suffering, why don't I ruin my knees so I can relate to that? <laughs> why would you run a marathon? A marathon is a dangerous thing to do. The ancient Greek man who invented the marathon, you know what his cause of death was? He died running a marathon. <laughs> If you don't know this story, thousands of years ago, the ancient Greeks were invaded and they fought this big battle and then they won, you know, which was their preferred outcome. And then one guy ran 26 miles back to Athens. He gets there, he goes, listen, everybody, great news. We won the battle. But he was so tired, he just collapsed dead. And then everyone in the city was just like, yeah, we already know. The Kenyan guy got here like two hours before you. He's not even tired, he's over there dancing. You should have trained, I mean, we have a running group and... Well, why do people run? Because they want good bodies, that's why. I learned a while ago there's a lot of different female body types. 
Now, look, I've been watching women for years, but I did not know I was supposed to be putting you in the fruit-based body categories. I think, though, that with men, there's only two body types. Like, either you have the kind of body where people are stoked when you take your shirt off, or not. And you know which one you are. You don't need a magazine quiz to figure that out. You know, and you carry the weight of that knowledge with you everywhere. How many of us non-abbed men have thought, wow, I'm sweaty and uncomfortable right now. I would love to take my shirt off. But I don't want to upset everyone at the bank. <laughs> you guys seem like a great audience. Um, once again, thank you for being here. Whenever I look into audiences, the first people I always notice, always, are alpha males. <laughs> and not a lot here tonight. <laughs> but they're usually very easy to spot because they're very big guys. When I'm on stage, they have a very confused look on their face because they're like, why is this arrogant nerd trying to lead us? I hate comparing myself physically to alpha males because they all look like these beautiful upside-down triangles. Whereas, I don't know if you can tell, but I have the wrists of a duchess. Like, my forearms look really good inside of long white gloves. I struggle opening jars. That's a real problem I have, and it's not good when I'm trying to impress my girlfriend with a romantic pickle. When I shake hands, I have to be so careful to keep my wrist straight. Otherwise, it so easily turns into an enchanté. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in a relationship, and because of that, one weird effect of that is that I now enjoy going to the gym more than I ever have before. I like the gym now because my goal is just to get a good body for a relationship. That's a lot easier than a dating body, right? A good body for a relationship is just whatever body got you into the relationship. Now just maintain. That's a much lower bar than a good body for dating by about six abs. And now whenever it's summer and I go to the beach and I see like really strong ripped guys with their shirts off, I just think, wow, you must feel so alone to be motivated to look like that. <laughs> I can't watch the Olympics anymore. It makes me feel too sad. It's like if only you had somebody to go home to, you wouldn't feel the need to jump so high. I I'm in a uh, long-term, a serious long-term relationship, and I don't know if this is normal for a long-term relationship, but my girlfriend and I get asked a lot whether we are siblings. <laughs> and we used to say no, like immediately. But now I say yes. And then we make out. Sometimes I wonder, like, does my girlfriend really love kissing or does she really hate me talking? Like, why does she always kiss me so hard when I start talking about history? Like, I get it. It's very exciting, but also suspicious. It's, I hope it's okay that I call her my girlfriend. In my head, I think, should I say girlfriend or should I say partner? But I always end up saying girlfriend. And I think it's because I feel kind of entitled to it. Because I didn't spend all those nights in high school alone wishing for a partner. <laughs> and, oh, the things I'd like to do with a partner right now. <laughs> right? A girlfriend just sounds a lot cooler. Like a girlfriend will text you from her apartment and say, come over. Your partner texts you from the next room, why haven't you left yet? <laughs> we need toilet paper. Your girlfriend will meet you at a bar wearing a leather jacket, right? Your partner is at home eating chips in bed and trying to keep it a secret. 
Sometimes my girlfriend, she'll ask kind of obvious questions. Like we were having dinner at a restaurant and she was like, do you think that the server can tell from watching us that we're in like a serious relationship? So I said, well, we walked in holding hands and since then we've been sitting in silence for 30 minutes. So yeah, I think he knows that this is our anniversary. Then at the end of that meal, that server just brought us separate bills. <laughs> Unprompted. Which is a crazy power that servers have. They can be like, I've been watching you two all night, and you should not be together. <laughs> she also asked me, out of the blue, she asked me, like, growing up, did you and your friends ever measure your penises? And I was like, no. No. Gross. We weighed them. <laughs> you get what you need to know a lot faster that way. And if you know the acceleration, you can calculate force. That's a creative way to remind people of physics. <laughs> My girlfriend, she came to me with a list of all the celebrities she thinks she should be able to hook up with if she ever got the chance. And this upset me a lot, but then she said I could have my own list. So I just copied hers exactly. <laughs> so that way if we ever run into John Merrick and be like, hold on you guys, I'm coming as well because he's also on my list. Right? It's important to do things together as a couple so you have shared experiences to tell your grandchildren. My girlfriend is not just my girlfriend anymore. She is now also my landlord. Which is great because I get to pay my rent using my bedroom abilities. Plus the exact amount of money I owe in rent. So, it's pretty tough to make rent now. <laughs> the other day, I actually woke her up. By, I woke her up, she was napping, and she wasn't mad at me. She was, she was actually like, I was just having a sex dream about you. So then I said, well, I'm right here. And then she went back to sleep. So it's never been tougher to make rent. I like complimenting her. Sometimes, I don't know if you do this, I'll go for like a new compliment. Like I was trying to tell her that I think she's very attractive and I said, you're a stone cold fox. And then I realized that's a weird compliment. Because what is a stone cold fox? It can only be a dead fox. Like, if we were on a hike and then I saw the carcass, the rotting carcass of a fox, I'm not going to be like, hey, Twins. <laughs> That's how hot you are. <laughs> she likes, truthfully, she likes a lot of things about me. What she doesn't like is that I'm a jazz lover. And when I say that, I'm not talking about my taste in music. What I mean is that I'm a jazz lover because the way that I make love <laughs> is like jazz. Because <laughs> the way that I make love is not very popular. I start off with a few familiar moves, then an hour of weird improv <laughs> that will put you to sleep. And once a year, there's a festival. <laughs> I'm very happy not to be dating anymore. I did not like dating. What I hated most about dating was first dates. First dates are very hard. You have to sit down with a stranger and listen to them talk about themselves, even though you've Googled them. <laughs> like, like, okay, I know where you work, okay? Let's get to the things I can't research. <laughs> My big problem with first dates is I would get way too ahead of myself if things were going well, right? I would think like, oh, this is going great. Are we going to be boyfriend and girlfriend? Does she want the same or separate gravestones? 
I would think that. I wouldn't say it. I'm not an idiot. I would beat around the bush. I'd be like, so, um, what's your favorite kind of engraving? And I'm happy, I'm happy to be off of any dating sites. I never did any religious dating sites. Um, oh, I, I did one kind, I'm Jewish, and like I went on the Jewish one and there's no one here. Uh, but there's a lot of different dating sites for religions. There's J-Date for Jews. There's Christian Mingle for Christians. There's probably a Muslim one. Um, there might be one for agnostics, but no one knows. <laughs> I did a f like a few dating apps. The one, only thing I like about dating apps is that you have to put like a one to two sentence description of yourself. Words that describe yourself. And you can learn a lot about someone by what they choose. Like I would see some women and they would just write, I just love life. And that's great because that tells me you have zero life experience. <laughs> oh, you love life? You should live more of it then. This is a video game on which you are at the tutorial level only. <laughs> My favorite one I ever saw was one woman she had, I'm just here looking for a tall guy who can lift me up and reach for things. And I was like, I think what you're looking for is a ladder. And then I sent her a link to Home Depot. I'm very happy that I'm not dating anymore. I used to date according to astrological signs. If a woman believed in astrology, I would not date her. Ooh, a divided room. I think it's because it, it's, it, it's just different perspectives. I think either you're an astrology person or you're a science person. I just think that I'm sorry to say astrology is a bit more self-centered. Because with science, you look out at all the stars and you go like, wow, the universe is huge and I'm just a tiny part of it. Then with astrology, you look out at all the same stars and you go, what does all that say about me? <laughs> like, what does that galaxy have to do with my personality? Because it's got to be something. You see those stars over there? that are so far away, it takes millions and millions of years for light from them to even reach us. That's why I'm late to stuff. <laughs> it's the only explanation. And look, I know I'm not changing anyone's minds here. I know that. I know you're thinking like, yeah, Jacob, obviously astrology is a silly belief. Or you're thinking, yeah, Jacob, obviously you're a Taurus. I know, I know. One time I was at a party and I was saying this stuff and a woman came by and she was like, you know, you're making fun of astrology, but it's very important to me. And just to show you that it's powerful, I can tell right away you're a Taurus. And it was a great moment for me because there was a group of people around and I just turned to her and I was like, I'm a Pisces. Like, what are you talking about? I don't know if you ever disproved someone with like three words, but it just feels amazing especially if other people are there. And when that happened, obviously I was lying to her. I'm clearly a Taurus, but I'm not gonna be responsible for spreading this BS. I just wanna say, if, if what I just said uh, has upset you because astrology is an important thing in your life, because after all, this is the West Coast, right? I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, you should have seen this coming in your horoscope. <laughs> I guess my point is that human beings, we have, clearly we have a lot of illogical beliefs. Like why is it that we think that one kind of animal is good, but then a very similar kind of animal is bad? Like why do we all love doves, but hate pigeons? I think it's a white privilege thing, right? Because doves are just white pigeons. That's like the only difference between them. Doves are pigeons that couldn't make it in the streets. They are gentrified pigeons. I guarantee you, every person here tonight considers the pigeon to be a totally filthy, disgusting animal. 
At the same time, Dove is the world's leading mascot for soap. <laughs> Can you imagine a soap called Pigeon? <laughs> Try launching that brand. I dare you. If you get swarmed by a flock of pigeons, you're going to be like, oh my God, I need every vaccine possible. Rush me to the emergency room. Or you're going to go home and shower and use all the Dove you have. You get swarmed by a flock of doves, you're gonna be like, oh my God, is somebody about to propose? <laughs> Magic is in the air, right? Because doves are a symbol, whereas a pigeon is an omen. <laughs> if you get a piece of paper and there's a dove on it, you're gonna be like, I've probably been invited to a wedding or my enemies are making peace with me. <laughs> if you get a piece of paper in the mail and there's a pigeon on it, oh no. We're getting evicted. That's what that means. I like, um, I'm a big fan of dairy. I like dairy a lot. I like consuming it. I think we should always have it. Some people really don't like dairy. Now, a lot of people in this city even, maybe in this room, they could be here. They all look the same as us. Some people who don't like dairy They'll say, like, you know that human beings were the only animal that drinks the milk of another animal. And they say it like that's a bad thing. <laughs> Have you seen how we're doing compared to other animals? <laughs> we're dominating. <laughs> we're on a 4,000-year streak. <laughs> I think milk could be the reason. Either we need to drink more milk or we need to make sure tigers never get any. Both of those. Great ways forward. Did you know that there's fewer than 4,000 tigers left in the world? Yeah, it's very concerning. At the same time, if there were 4,000 tigers in this neighborhood, very concerning. There is such thing as too many tigers. We should all be very afraid of tigers. If I can leave you with any message tonight is be scared of them. It's weird. A lot of people, when you ask, What's your, what animal do you fear most? They'll say spiders. I don't understand that at all because I'm not afraid of any animal I can defeat with a cup. <laughs> Try defending yourself against a large cat with dishware. <laughs> For anyone who's confused, before tigers were famous for selling frosted fl flakes, <laughs> for selling frosted flakes and gasoline, they were mainly known as being a ferocious predator of people. Like, if tigers have the chance, they will hunt and eat everyone you know and love. Which makes me feel very bad for tigers in the zoo. Like, imagine if you had to spend the rest of your life in jail being visited by sandwiches. <laughs> Even if you were trained and fed by a sandwich, you're still gonna be like, I want a bite. That's the decisive thing, I think, in the debate between dogs and cats, is that you can make a dog the size of a wolf and not compromise safety. If you make a cat the size of a lion, it is a lion. <laughs> Congratulations. I think every house cat kind of looks at their owner and is like, this is good for now, but I may grow. When I was growing up, one of my favorite books as a child was Clifford the Big Red Dog. And you can't have Clifford the Big Red Cat because there's no other characters left at the end of that book. Just a very tired cat. I will say, though, I prefer, I prefer aquariums to zoos. And we have a great aquarium in this city, which for some reason we built right next to the ocean. <laughs> it's like a few hundred feet away from the ocean. That's so cruel. It's so close. Like, there are probably octopuses that are commuting. <laughs> like, the aquarium should be so close to the ocean that the fish are rooting for a tsunami. Like, all we need is a slip and slide, and we're out of here. We're home. 
I think my least favorite animal of all is the moth. I do not like moths. They are a very bad insect. Because moths are lazy. Because moths are obsessed with light, but they're only around during nighttime. Wake up earlier! If a moth ever saw daylight, it'd be like, oh my god, everything I want is everywhere. I'm setting an alarm. But I do feel kind of bad for moths because they're always compared to butterflies. And butterflies are the celebrities of the insect world. Butterflies are the one insect you can fill a room with and then charge admission. Find me another bug that raises property value. And then they both start off the same. Both moths and butterflies, they start off as caterpillars and they go into cocoons and they come out and all the moths are like, oh no. I'm a moth. I could have been that, but I'm this. And I get that. I get that so much. Because I'm in my 30s, and it feels a lot like when you're in your 30s and you go on like LinkedIn and you're like, how successful are people I grew up with? And you're like, oh no, I've been a moth the whole time. So I do sympathize with moths. I also have a lot of sympathy for politicians. I have a lot of sympathy for politicians because imagine if every four years your boss was like, let's see if you get to keep your job. <laughs> We're gonna ask everyone to weigh in on how you've been doing. And you're like, have they been paying close attention to my progress? No, they barely read about you. They're gonna look at your face and make a snap judgment. So get ready for what the public thinks. Hope there aren't any photos of your old Halloween costumes. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll be fine as long as you didn't do anything you regret in your 20s. Because that's going to come up. I think wherever you are politically, I think we can all agree it's very annoying when political parties will call us asking for stuff. I'm tired of it. When they do it, I just talk back to them. Like, the last election I got called by the Conservative Party of Canada and they asked me to donate money to them. And so I said, if anyone should understand that in life, you don't just get financial handouts. <laughs> it's you, the Conservative Party. <laughs> oh, what's that, you need money? Why don't you go out there and earn it like you tell us to do every day all the time? How about that, right? Does the Green Party call me and ask me to frack them some oil? <laughs> I believe, this might be a lame belief, but I believe you should always vote, no matter what. You should always vote in elections. And some people think that uh, if they're not inspired, they don't need to. Like, none of these candidates inspire me, so why should I choose? And if you think that, you don't understand how our system works. Because democracy is not about picking the best person. It's about not picking the worst. <laughs> Do you understand the difference there? You're supposed to choose the least worst option. You're supposed to vote the same way you pick an avocado. <laughs> Just like, no, 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 maybe. Then you get home and you're like, oh no, it's been bad the whole time. <laughs> but we have hope that the next avocado, that one's going to change things. <laughs> Just because you're choosing between a bad and a worse choice doesn't mean that not choosing is a good idea. If you're walking down the street, someone jumps out of an alleyway and is like, give me your money or I'll beat you up. You don't want to be like, well, neither of those inspires me. <laughs> Ask me again in four years. <laughs> It's interesting whenever a politician gets accused of being a racist, or any public figure gets accused of being a racist, because their first line of defense is always just to point out an exception. They just point to one friend who they have who's a visible minority. And they're like, see, not a racist. <laughs> and that still works a lot of the time, which is crazy, because that's not the standard we apply to most things. You can't be like, your honor, how can this court find me guilty of murder? When? I clearly have 
several friends who are alive. <laughs> Case closed. And look how diverse they are. One of them is. Like a lot of Canadians, I follow uh, politics very closely when it's American. And one thing will always happen during American elections that blows my mind. No matter what, always a lot of left-wing American actors will threaten to move to Canada if the Republicans win. And I'm always like, what are you talking about? Do you not know how much of a demotion it is to go from being a Hollywood actor to a uh, Canadian actor? <laughs> like, really? You're going to take an a million percent pay cut to be in a show that ends with Of Green Gables? The rapper Drake has a famous song where he says that he started from the bottom. And the bottom he's talking about is when he was an actor on Canadian TV. That's where our rappers come from. Do you understand? In the United States, it's systemic urban poverty. Here it's because we do not pay entertainers well. And so they must rap. And what are my political beliefs? No one has asked. <laughs> my political beliefs are that I am a coward. <laughs> I'm a centrist. I'm not very left-wing and I'm not very right-wing. I'm not conservative, but at the same time, I think that anyone who's ever tried to split a bill with more than eight people knows that socialism is tough. <laughs> Right, if you can't figure out which of your friends is not tipping, maybe this doesn't work for the whole country. <laughs> I'm not saying I don't love capitalism, but I also don't hate it. Some people who hate capitalism will express it in odd ways. Like one time I was on the street and I saw a guy wearing a t-shirt, like a regular promotional t-shirt that said, down with capitalism. And my first thought was just, did you buy that? <laughs> Because unless the government gave it to you, you're kind of off message. If anyone here isn't exactly sure what capitalism is, just find me after the show and I'll explain it to you for 50 bucks. <laughs> Obviously, that's a joke. I'm not going to explain it to you. I'm going to take your money and walk away because that's how you learn about capitalism. Thank you. A few pe how about half of you applauded that? I assume that, that's the half of people who are doing well financially. <laughs> I want to let you all know that um, if you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. Okay? That's not a thing I believe in. That's just a quote that us millennials seem to share on social media. And I don't know why. Because that's crazy logic, right? If you can't handle my worst, you don't deserve my best. That's like if a fire said to you, hey, if you don't let me kill your family, can't use me to cook. <laughs> when I see someone share that, I'm like, I don't think I can handle you at your best. I think your best is posting that to Facebook to warn us about how insane you are. Sometimes I feel like a subpar Canadian because my French is très mal. <laughs> and it should be better because I went to school in French immersion for eight years of my life. And I also lived in Montreal for a while. And after all that, my French is only good enough to understand cultural references. Like, I can translate the title of the movie Chocolat very quickly. <laughs> and I know that Bon Jovi is actually French for good Jovi. <laughs> Say whatever you want about the French, but without them, kissing would just be two open mouths. So, I mean, I think, I assume the French invented French kissing. Either that, or it was just some guy kissing a girl, and then he's like, I'm gonna slip some tongue in. And then she was like, what are you doing? 
It's French. <laughs> um, my favorite hobby in life is correcting people. <laughs> like, that's what I'm about. Last week, I was having lunch with a friend of mine, and he announced to me, he's like, by the way, I'm a vegetarian now. And then he ordered fish. So I had to be like, oh, no, you're confused. Like, technically, you're not a vegetarian. You're a, uh, what's it? Hypocrite. The other word for that kind of diet is pescatarian, which I don't know if you know this. That's actually Latin for whiny underachiever. Some people say that vegetarians don't get enough energy from what they eat, and I don't think that's true. I think it's the opposite. I think people who eat meat, way too much energy. Because you go downtown on a weekend night, you see two guys punching the crap out of each other. What are the odds that altercation is fueled by salad? Right? Being an obnoxious person is mostly a meat-fueled operation. Vegetarians do fight each other, but it's through poems on the internet. Right? Like, feelings are hurt, not faces. If I say to you, I think you should try being a vegetarian, it's not health advice. Because I find you annoying, and I want to cut off your power supply. That's all that is. I live near a lot of vegetables because I live near a community garden. Or as I call it, whole foods for raccoons. Right? Because raccoons are smart animals. They're going to see those organic tomatoes and be like, you know what? I should stop eating garbage. I'm washing my hands anyway. Being a vegetarian, all joking aside, it is good for the environment. I think you should do things that are good for the environment. That's a value I have. It shouldn't be the only reason why you do something, though. Because there are some things that are good for the environment, bad for people. Like murder and cannibalism. <laughs> Mathematically speaking, very good for the environment. <laughs> what better way to lower your carbon footprint than to eat somebody else's. I'm not even saying that. That's a quote from Al Gore's book. Um, another thing I do not like. I'm, I'm happy that, we've, that it's the end of December now. Um, I do not like the Christmas season. I do not care for it whatsoever. And what I don't like about it is the cheer. <laughs> the idea, oh, we need to spread, spread Christmas around. We need to tell everybody it's Christmas. We need to include everyone in Christmas. Because I'm Jewish. I'm part of a religious minority. And the things about religious minorities is that we're very good at having holidays that do not inconvenience you. Right? When was the last time you were overwhelmed by Yom Kippur? You know what no one has ever said ever? I'm so tired of Starbucks playing all this atonement music. So if you see someone and they're not participating in Christmas, just leave them alone. Please. Like, I don't want to hear Silent Night. I want to experience it. <laughs> and I don't, know if, I don't know if you can tell that I'm Jewish. My name is Jacob Samuel. It's a pretty Jewish name. Actually, it's a stage name. Samuel is my middle name. And I use it on stage because to me, Jacob Samuel sounds like the right amount of Jewish for this. Because my real name, I think, is way too Jewish for a mainstream audience. Because it's Jacob Goldfiddler on the roof. It's hyphenated. <laughs> and when I say I'm Jewish, what I mean is that, you know, my parents are Jewish. I identify as Jewish. Um, I'm not religious. It's just how I identify sexually. <laughs> I consider myself to be a cultural Jew. And what that means is that I say I'm Jewish, but I don't believe in the religion. So I'm a Jew in the same way that I'm a fan of the Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> I have no faith in the organization at all. But if a miracle happens, I'm showing up in the jersey.
A few more things. <laughs> I, I really don't like stereotypes about Jewish people. I really don't care for them. There's a stereotype that we complain too much, and I don't know how we're supposed to respond to that without <laughs> confirming it. It's not fair. There's also a stereotype that Jewish people are cheap. And I've never understood this, because being cheap is also a stereotype for people from India and the Chinese, and Arabs, and Africans. And if you're paying attention, that's most of the world. <laughs> so what is it? Is most of the world cheap, or are white Christians bad with money? Because <laughs> one of those things has to be true. And last time I checked, a sailboat, pretty bad investment. I love, personally, I love the word Jew. It's great, it's only three letters, it gets you right where you wanna go. But here on the West Coast, some people will hesitate to say Jew because they're worried it might be offensive. And I want you all to know that it's not. Unless you're pointing, but otherwise, like it's fine, like you can all call Jews Jews. Obviously we prefer the term doctor, but Actually, the worst thing you can call a Jew, the worst thing you can call a Jew is kike, which to me is a very confusing racial slur because kike just sounds like an Australian person saying cake. <laughs> so if I ever heard a group of Australians be like, oh yeah, let's grab a knife and cut up a kike, I'd be like, oh no, one of two things can happen right now. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. You've been such a great audience. Thanks again. Have a wonderful evening.